Judge Maroon uh, was president of the um, first ICTY and then the mechanism for a number of years and has stepped down from that role earlier this year. In recognition of his many years of service, <coughs> the ABC would like to present this award and our thanks and gratitude. And I understand Ms. McIntyre has some words, kind words to say for you. So, if you'd like to. I just want to thank the association for this award. Uh, let me just say a few words uh, before passing the floor to Gabriela. Um, if this uh, institution, the ICTY, the ICTR, and the mechanism, are widely regarded that not only by people in the tribunal, but by the UN Security Council and the international community as a whole, as being perhaps the gold standard of international institutions, judicial institutions. It is because our Lord Star, at, from the beginning, has been in the, recognizing the critical importance of due process and fairness in our proceedings. This meant due process and fairness to the accused. This meant uh, due process to the prosecutor also. But primarily, it meant due process and fairness and respect to people who have appeared before us, the council. You have been the heart of the tribunal. And without you, we would not have been able to establish for the tribunal the kind of reputation that we have now. And for this, I thank you and I salute you. Thank you. thank the Association of Defence Council for inviting me here today to deliver remarks about the remarkable contributions of Judge Theodore Moron to international criminal justice. It is an honour to be here. Before proceeding, I would simply underscore that my remarks today are made in my personal capacity and not my capacity as Chief Judicial Advisor at the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. As many of you may know, Judge Meron joined the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia following his election by the UN General Assembly in March 2001. He was assigned to the ICTY's Appeals Chamber in November 2001, and in 2002, he was sworn in as a judge in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda as well. During his tenure at the ICTY, Judge Meron served as president for four terms, having been elected by his peers, more than any other president in the history of international criminal tribunals, and by virtue of that role, also served as the presiding judge of the appeals chamber of both the ICTY and the ICTR. In addition, he served as the president of the mechanism, the successor institution to the ICTY and the ICTR by appointment of the UN Secretary General from before the mechanism's inception, nearly seven years ago. On 18th of January 2019, he completed his presidency and he remains a judge on the mechanism's roster of judges. In my remarks today, I will begin by offering some reflections concerning Judge Meron's scholarly contributions before joining the bench. I will then turn to his work during his nearly two decades as a judge, before ending with an examination of his role as a leader of two international courts. Prior to taking up his judicial position at the ICTY, Judge Meron was probably well known to all of us with an interest in international criminal law from his prolific work as an academic. While his intellectual interests have been wide-ranging, much of his scholarly output reflects an abiding concern with the need to alleviate human suffering in times of conflict, a concern perhaps rooted in his own experiences in a labour camp during the Second World War as a child, 
though not limited to that context. Indeed, as much as his early academic writings, we see an enduring focus on ensuring that people are protected by the law in all types of conflict. For example, in multiple articles published as far back as the 1980s, he advocated adoption by states of a declaration of minimum humanitarian standards to be applicable in situations of internal violence, quote, that fell below the thresholds of applicability of international humanitarian instruments, but within the margin of public emergency, close quote. He advocated that such a declaration which would draw upon standards of both humanitarian and human rights instruments would reflect an irreducible core of humanitarian norms that must be applied at all times, thus making it harder for governments to deny applicability based on the particularities of a given conflict. Although no such declaration was ultimately adopted, Judge Meron's conceptualization of a core of humanitarian norms applicable in any type of conflict presaged the subsequent conclusion by the ICTY Appeals Chamber in Tadic that certain principles and rules of international humanitarian law apply to internal armed conflicts just as they do to international armed conflicts. In other academic work, Judge Meron focused on the customary status of international humanitarian law, evidence of his long-standing interest in the development of the law and in raising awareness of customary prohibitions that are applicable regardless of the treaty commitments of states, and thus may offer greater protections to individuals during times of conflict than treaty law alone. Indeed, his considerable interest in the power and proper identification of customary law was demonstrated in his 1996 article in the American Journal of International Law on the continuing role of custom in the formation of international humanitarian law, where he analysed the ICTY Appeals Chamber's dis discussion of customary international law in its pivotal 1995 decision in the Tadic case. Taking note of the Appeals Chamber's strong reliance on opinion juris, Judge Moron questioned whether the tribunal, quote, could not have made a greater effort to identify actual state practice, as without some significant discussion of operational practice, it may be difficult to persuade governments to accept the tribunal's vision of some aspects of customary international law." Close quote. This is not to suggest that he disagreed with the Tadic ruling. Rather, his concern was that its reasoning could have been more robust to maximize its authority. As these examples suggest, a recurring theme of Judge Meron's scholarly literature has been his focus on the power of the law and on its rigorous but progressive development. In other words, on the ways in which the law can be articulated and applied in a principled yet pragmatic manner to address real world problems. Nowhere is this focus reflected more readily than in his 1993 article on rape as a crime under international humanitarian law. In that article, he tracked the normative development of the concept of rape as a war crime and a crime against humanity, noting that rape had been prohibited by the law of war for centuries, but seldom prosecuted. He went on to observe that following the events in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, the broader hesitation about recognizing rape as a war crime or a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions had begun to dissipate. Given these developments, he posited that if rape may, as the ICRC had declared, constitute the great breach of willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, then surely, in certain circumstances, rape could also rise to the level of the great breach of torture or inhumane treatment, or if used as a national instrument of ethnic cleansing to the level of a crime against humanity. At the time of his writing, the idea that the crime of rape could constitute a serious international crime other than the grave breach of willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health was truly novel. Yet within a decade of his article, both the ICTR and the ICTY had issued rulings making clear 
that rape could constitute the international crimes of genocide and torture. Judge Meron himself would go on to play a role in shaping the jurisprudence in this context, serving, for instance, on the bench of the appeals chamber in the Kudarach et al. case, in which he and his fellow judges endorsed the trial chamber's definition of rape, importantly rejecting the appellant's resistant requirement as, quote, wrong on the law and absurd on the facts, close quote. He and his fellow judges also confirmed the trial chamber's conclusion that force was not an element of rape and that the coercive circumstances present in the case made consent impossible. As his articles on a declaration of minimum humanitarian standards applicable in all types of conflicts and his 1993 article on rape as a crime under international law suggests, the desire to address perceived gaps in the availability of protections arising under international law has been yet another reoccurring theme to Judge Meron's scholarly opus. In this same vein, in his later academic work, Judge Meron focused on the relationship between international humanitarian law and human rights law, including the increasing normative interplay of these two bodies of law, and discussed what he coined as a humanization of the law. He expounded upon how tightly interwoven both legal regimes had become as a result of jurisprudential developments at the ICTY and the ICTR, observing that, in practice, the tribunals had turned time and again to human rights law in construing the material elements of substantive crimes arising under international humanitarian law. Judge Moran made clear how these developments enhanced the protective character of both bodies of law, with the consequence being that, for the first time, human rights violations became subject to criminal enforcement. The concern that Judge Meron showed as an academic for the protective role of the law has, if anything, only grown since he joined the bench in 2001. Indeed, the unifying and consistent theme of Judge Meron's jurisprudence at the ICTY, the ICTR, and the mechanism has been his intention to ensuring that the protections afforded by the law are fully respected. Whether these protections concern the victims of terrible cruelty in the context of an armed conflict or individuals who stand accused of violating international law. By virtue of this focus, Judge Meron's jurisprudence has also played a pivotal role in protecting the legitimacy and authority of the judicial process at all three tribunals where he has served. In his substantive rulings, Judge Meron has time and again helped to clarify key aspects of the law, thereby strengthening the protections afforded to civilians and other vulnerable individuals in times of armed conflict. For instance, in the Galich case, he was a member of the appeals bench that determined that the prohibition of terror against the civilian population, as enshrined in Articles 51.2 of Additional Protocol 1 and Article 13.2 of Additional Protocol 2, clearly belonged to customary international law and entailed individual criminal responsibility in customary international law. In the case of Kudarat et al., meanwhile, he and his fellow judges clarified the definition of torture in customary international law affirming that the public official requirement found in the Convention Against Torture is not a requirement under customary international law. In the case of Merzvich and Schlevanschenen, over which he presided, the Appeals Chamber held that Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, quote, reflects the same spirit of the duty to protect members of armed forces who have laid down their arms and are detained as the specific provisions afforded to prisoners of war in Geneva Convention 3 as a whole." Close quote. The appeals bench thus identified as customary international law the fundamental, fundamental non-derogable principle that prisoners of war must be treated humanely and protected from physical and mental harm from the time they fall into the power of the enemy until their final release and repatriation. And more recently, in the Ptolemyr case, over which he likewise presided, the appeals chamber clarified the meaning of serious mental harm in the context of the crime of genocide, including that threats of death and knowledge of impending death 
can amount to serious mental harm for purposes of the crime, genocide. Thus, as the appeals chamber made clear, a trial chamber could conclude that the harm suffered by a victim prior to death constituted a separate act of genocide. From the beginning of his time at both the ICTY and the ICTR, Judge Meron has also been scrupulous about ensuring respect for fair trial rights and for due process protections to which accused persons are entitled. For example, in an interlocutory appeal in the Milosevic case, he and his fellow judges upheld the decision of the trial chamber to impose counsel on the accused but determined that the trial chamber's order of modalities to be followed by the assigned counsel, quote, sharply restricted Milosevic's ability to participate in his case, relegating him to a visibly second-tier role, close quote. On remand, the trial chamber was ordered to, quote, craft a working regime that minimizes the practical impact of the formal assignment of counsel, except to the extent required in the interest of justice, close quote. In an interlocutory appeal in the Ziggy Razo case, Judge Miron and the rest of the appeals bench construed the statutory requirement pertaining to the right of the accused to be tried in his or own presence, applying the proportionality principle and ultimately concluding that to allow testimony taken outside of the accused's presence to remain on the record would seriously damage the integrity of the proceedings. And in the appeals judgment in the Nahimana et al case, Judge Meron joined in the holding that when an accused is represented by counsel, the presence of his counsel or co-counsel at a hearing is essential. To undo the prejudice caused to the accused by the absence of counsel, evidence that the trial chamber had permitted to be taken in counsel's absence was expunged from the record and the accused convictions re-examined. These are just a few examples of the judgments and decisions in which Judge Meron participated that established significant due process standards and requirements for international criminal proceedings. Further examples abound from the interlocutory ruling in the Godovina et al case holding that members of the defence, including defence investigators, enjoyed functional immunity with regards to acts that fall within the fulfilment of their official functions due to their functions being, quote, necessary for the proper functioning of the tribunal, close quote. To the numerous cases at the ICTR where notice requirements were found to have been breached and convictions vacated as a result. Judge Miron's commitment to procedural fairness has also been evident in his substantive rulings. While, for example, he had already advocated a conservative and traditional approach to the identification and application of customary international law principles in his academic work, as a judge, he took this a step further, rightly recognising that such caution and care were necessary due to the obligation of the tribunals as criminal courts to respect the fundamental principle of legality. This was exemplified by the approach taken in the interlocutory appeal in the case of Hadzi Zanovich et al, over which Judge Meron presided. In that case, Judge Meron was part of the majority of three that held that a commander could not be convicted under the principle of command responsibility for failing to punish the commission of offences by subordinates if the offences had been committed by the subordinates before he became their commander. Strong dissenting opinions were issued by the judges in the minority, who advocated a more pragmatic approach and the adoption of progressive interpretations of relevant treaty provisions to avoid a gap in the law. But that, as the majority recognised, is not how customary international rules are identified. Rather, they are identified through evidence of opinion jurists and state practice, and such evidence was absent. Thus, Judge Meron's opinion was guided by the state of the law at the relevant time, even though the result left a gap in the law's protective ambit. While as an academic, he had advocated the closure of such gaps, including through creative means, as a judge at a criminal court, he recognised that his role required him to ensure strict adherence to the law and to the principle of legality. 
The strict requirements of criminal law and Judge Merrill's commitment to their observance has been evident in other cases too, particularly when it comes to the judicial obligation to ensure that convictions are only entered or upheld on the basis of evidence established beyond a reasonable doubt and are in accordance with the applicable law. From the ICTY's Kirstich case to the ICTR cases of Nahimana et al. and Mugenzi and Muguruznaza, Judge Meron's jurisprudence reflects not simply his readiness to rule based on his judicial conscience, even where doing so may require overturning a trial chamber's findings, but also a dedication to ensuring that the judicial process is and remains fundamentally fair. It may come as no surprise that Judge Meron's commitment in this regard has perhaps led him into controversy. We need merely mention the names of people such as Ante Godovina and Montura Parisic to be reminded of the degree to which certain of the rulings in which he took part have generated strong reactions in the press, in affected communities, and in the international community at large. One could, of course, view the rulings in question as proof that even individuals who come before international criminal courts, as most persons accused of international crimes do, with a pre-existing narrative about who they were and what they had done, can be treated fairly and in accordance with the dictates of the law, including the principle of in dubio pro reo. However, this was not how these rulings were largely understood, and the controversy sparked by these judgments was further compounded by the famous incident in which Judge Haho sent an email to 56 friends musing on the current state of the law at the ICTY in light of these judgments and asking the question, quote, have any American or Israeli officials ever exerted pressure on the American presiding judge to ensure a change of direction, close quote. One of the most difficult challenges faced by Judge Meron as a judge as opposed to an academic has been that he could not clarify misinformation or address misconceptions surrounding certain of his rulings, including the judgments in these cases. While the prosecutor could publicly speak about his disappointment with the outcomes and criticise the judgments as he saw fit, the judges involved in the cases could not. Judgments are, of course, meant to speak for themselves. Yet neither the general public nor, indeed, many other interested observers read the judgments. They relied, instead, on media reports. And as we all know, media reports are often not accurate and, with regards to these judgments in particular, were not favourable to the outcomes in either case. Indeed, as an aside, these cases in many ways came to stand for principles with which they had nothing to do. A common misconception about these judgments and one evinced in the email of Judge Harhoff was that the ICTY appeals chamber had elevated the threshold for superior responsibility to the point where commanders may only be held liable for the crimes of their subordinates if it can be shown that the commander essentially ordered subordinates to commit specific crimes. That is not correct. Neither case changed the ICTY's jurisprudence on command responsibility. Rather, it was the application of the existing law to the evidence in both these cases that resulted in findings that command responsibility had not been established. In the Godovina and Markic case, this was because a majority of the appeals chamber was not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Godovina had failed in the exercise of his duties as a commander. In the Perisic case, it was because the appeals chamber concluded that Mr. Perisic did not have effective control over the Kojina Serb army. With respect to Judge Harhoff's questioning of Judge Meron's integrity as a judge, I think I need only rebut that question by reference to a famous legal opinion given by Judge Meron as a young legal advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the issue of Israeli settlements. The legal opinion was written in 1967 in the aftermath of the Six Day War, after the Israelis had captured the West Bank and Golan Heights. In a memo marked Top Secret, Judge Moran, Moran concluded that, quote, civilian settlement in the administrative territories contravenes the explicit provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention, close quote. A year later, he wrote a further opinion, noting that demolitions of houses, 
and deportations of Arabs suspected of subservient activities would violate the Fourth Geneva Convention and may constitute collective punishment. These opinions, given at that time, and given when the personal interests of Judge Meron as an ambitious professional near the beginning of his career would have been strong, speak volumes about his overriding commitment to the rule of law, then as now, and to the need to adhere to principle, even in the most highly charged of political contexts. The abiding commitment to principle has not simply informed Judge Meron's service as a judge at the ICTY, the ICTR, and the mechanism. It has also informed his time leading first the ICTY and then the mechanism, both institutions where he has served longer than any other president. As the president of the ICTY for four terms and as the president of the mechanism for nearly seven years, Judge Meron wielded significant power when it came to propelling the work of the institutions forward and representing the institutions to external audiences. At the ICTY, he was responsible for important steps in the implementation of the tribunal's completion strategy and took seriously his role to manage the work of chambers, consulting with his fellow judges frequently to ensure that cases moved ahead in a timely fashion without compromising their fairness in any respect. At the mechanism, he has overseen all aspects of the institution's establishment and early evolution, standing squarely behind efforts to innovate and to seek more cost-effective means of carrying out our work and championing the mechanism's potential to serve as a model for other courts. Even in the role of president, however, Judge Meron has continued to be guided by his unwavering allegiance to legal principle and fundamental fairness. This commitment has been amply demonstrated in the many decisions he rendered on requests for administrative review of decisions of the registrar, both at the ICTY and at the mechanism. While jurisprudentially, these rulings may not have the visibility of other decisions and judgments, they are terribly important to the integrity of the institution and the overall fairness of proceedings. These rulings have dealt with such issues as the rights of detainees in detention, including rights to speak to the media or to access a laptop, and the rights of defence counsel, including with regard to remuneration. This is not to suggest that Judge Meron was always persuaded by the applicant, but any accused or defence counsel seeking review of a decision of the registrar during Judge Meron's presidencies could be assured that his or her complaint would be treated seriously and fairly. Judge Meron's concern for principle, for fundamental fairness, and for the integrity of the institutions that he has led has also been manifest in other areas of his work as president. As president of the mechanism, he has consistently and repeatedly advocated for an appropriate resolution of the situation of those individuals either acquitted by the ICTR or convicted but released in Arusha. Individuals who are unable to return or are afraid of returning to their country of nationality. In Judge Meron's view, the resolution of this situation is not simply a humanitarian imperative. It also represents a crucial challenge for international justice. In his monitoring of cases referred by the ICTR for trial in national jurisdictions, he has also demonstrated a consistent concern with adherence to legal principle, going to considerable lengths to ensure respect to the conditions of the case's referral. While recognising that processes in national courts are different from international courts, Judge Meron has also been clear that fundamental norms of due process and fairness are necessary elements of both. Similarly, in his supervision of the enforcement of sentences in enforcement states, Judge Meron has addressed myriad complaints by convicted persons concerning their conditions of detention and concerns raised by independent monitors, thereby ensuring that core human rights standards concerning detention are respected. Issues of fairness, of principle, and of institutional integrity also drove the start of the mechanism's judicial operations under Judge Meron's leadership. In the very first decision rendered by the Appeals Chamber of the Mechanism, over which Judge Meron presided, the Appeals Chamber made clear 
that the mechanisms, statute, and rules of procedure and evidence reflect normative continuity with the statutes of the ICTY and the ICTR, as well as their respective rules. As the Appeals Chamber stated, quote, these parallels are not simply a matter of convenience or efficiency, but serve to uphold principles of due, due process and fundamental fairness, which are the cornerstone of international justice, close quote. And when that same fall, early in the mechanism's operations, a request for early release was brought by Paul Gizanimana, who had been convicted by the ICTR, Judge Meron was once again guided by his concern for fairness, principle, and institutional integrity. In ruling on the request, he looked to both the practice at the ICTY, where going back to the presidency of Judge Jordan, judges had almost always endorsed the grant of release at the two-third mark, and the practice of the ICTR, which had adopted a practice of early release at three quarters of the sentence. Recognising that this dis disparity would have to be resolved if the mechanism was to function as a single, unified institution, treating those individuals for whom it was responsible in full equality, Judge Moran proceeded to address the matter in accordance with the Lex Mitora principle and concluded that, quote, fundamental fairness and justice are best served if the ICTY practice applies uniformly to the entire prison population to be ultimately supervised by the mechanism, close quote. This and subsequent decisions to grant early release have not been without controversy. Indeed, Judge Meron has endured political pressure and personal attacks in relation to such rulings. That is, he remains steadfast in his view that basic human rights and principles of justice demand that even those convicted of international crimes should have their applications for early release considered fairly and should themselves be treated humanely is a testament to his vision of the role of international courts and of justice itself. This profound sense of responsibility for the integrity of international courts and international justice was also a motivating force behind Judge Meron's leadership in the development and adoption of a code of professional conduct for the judges of the mechanism. The first such code to be adopted at any of the ICTY, the ICTR, or the mechanism. He thereafter spearheaded a revision to the code to provide a complaints procedure, explaining that doing so reflected international best practice in relation to judicial accountability, and once again demonstrating his commitment to legal principle and his view of the role and responsibilities of an international criminal judge. Finally, we cannot ignore the politically unpopular but principled stand that Judge Meron took with respect to the situation of Judge Adian Sefar Akai, the first Turkish judge of the mechanism, who was arrested by the Turkish authorities along with thousands of others in 2016 for alleged acts directed against the constitutional order of Turkey. Judge Meron tirelessly and successfully advocated for a formal assertion of immunity for Judge Ake by the United Nations. He repeatedly highlighted the plight of Judge Ake before the General Assembly and the Security Council, appealing for a resolution of the matter and underscoring, as he did in a ruling ordering Turkey to cease all proceedings against Judge Ake, that the failure of Turkey to respect the immunity of Judge Ake fundamentally undermined the principle of judicial independence. When the matter was resolved through the decision of the Secretary General not to reappoint Judge Ake for a new term of office, Judge Meron publicly expressed his disagreement and strong disappointment with the decision and his, quote, grave concerns about the far-reaching consequences this decision will have for our institution and for international criminal justice more generally. I can assure you that Judge Meron's public statements on the situation of Judge Ake were not altogether well received. The fact that he was prepared to make them, knowing that they would not be welcomed by the powers that be in New York, speaks volumes as to the character of the man whom we honor today. In conclusion, throughout the many years I've worked with Judge Meron, it has always been a privilege and a pleasure to work alongside someone so driven by his commitment to human rights, to humanitarian principle, to fairness, to the rule of law, 
and to the need to respect the inherent dignity of all people, including those convicted of committing the most atrocious crimes imaginable. A tireless champion for justice and ensuring accountability, he has always recognised that justice and accountability are not about achieving some specific outcome, but rather about ensuring a principled process that itself serves to uphold and strengthen adherence to the law. Indeed, whether in his judicial rulings, such as the oft-quoted passages from the Kirsty Shapil's judgment over which he presided, and the 2006 Karamara et al. decision affirming the taking of judicial notice of the Rwandan genocide, or in the work undertaken during the many other chapters of his remarkable career, he has always demonstrated a profound appreciation and respect for the extraordinary power of the law itself. I salute you, Judge Mara, <laughs> for your extraordinary contributions to international criminal law and justice as an academic, as a judge, and as the president of two remarkable international courts, and for your abiding commitment to principle. Thank you. Previous panel. 